I'm Joan DeJean, author of The Queen's Embroiderer, and you're watching The Author's Voice. Welcome to the Author's Voice Network. Stranger Than Fiction is the category that we are talking about today, and that has uh, never been more appropriate than in the book we're about to discuss. My name is Paul Berlanga, and uh, we are here today with author Jean DeJone. We've got a book uh, called The Queen's Embroiderer. The Queen's Embroiderer is um, published by uh, Bloomsbury and uh, distributed by Macmillan, $30. It's a great value. It's uh, an incredible accomplishment. And if you're watching this on Facebook Live uh, or at home on your website, you can use this time to uh, submit a question. We just like your first name and where you're from, and the author will do her best to answer it. And, uh, and more important, you can actually order a signed copy of this volume uh, right now. You go to the Author's Voice uh, Network and uh, get your copy sent to you. So uh, we're going to introduce you now. Jean Dijon, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Okay, you wrote The Queen's Embroiderer, and uh, I, I took notes for this interview, and I have to say that they were a third of the length of the book, so I just gave up, okay. because there's, there's so much involved, and you're so articulate, and I, I'm going to just say that this is, this is a history that, that, that you, have a, you have a cool um, command of, but at the same time, you cover such passionate subjects. You bring alive people from 300 years ago. It's a PBS making and a PBS special in the making. So tell well, us... PBS should sign itself up right now. If absolutely. It wants to. <laughs> tell, us, tell us what the Queen's Embroiderer is about. That's a tough one. It's about uh, some very, very, very talented embroiderers who were also terrible men. Unconscionable. Yes, unconscionable, psychopaths. Uh, and for me, it was that mixture of high art, high fashion, and high crime that was irresistible, in addition to which the fact that they ruined the lives of a young couple, especially a young woman, whom I thought was absolutely incredible and heroic, and that I couldn't stand. So I did this to defend a woman. People would tell me in the archives, you do know she's been dead for 250 years, don't you? I said, I have had no proof of her death. She is not dead for me. Well, what's so admirable about that is that um, you show such restraint. You, you really keep yourself to the facts and you, you, you let the emotions wash over the reader in large part, and, uh, which the reader is uh, unable to resist because the, the story you build, um, as I just mentioned that this is called Stranger Than Fiction, the subcategory of the Authors of Voice Network, but you quote Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. Would you do that again here? Well, it's true. It is tr there are things you can't make up. Uh, if you're doing history, but in fiction you can do everything. But in I really limited myself to what I knew as an absolute fact. And anything else, people kept saying you can speculate, you can speculate. I do at times, for example, if someone had said, is she dead? I would say, yes, she is dead. But I have no death certificate, so I have no proof. I tried to do only th stories that I could absolutely prove, where I had the documentation. And I also tried to set not to, I felt, you know, obviously I judge. I just told you they were terrible men, but my goal was not to judge some characters as better than others, just to te try to tell the story. And so I deliberately chose what I hope is a rather neutral voice for most of it, because it seemed to me it was such an extraordinary tale that the tale itself did, would tell its story, and give it a tone. I think you succeed there admirably. And since you, since you the way you brought this up uh, uh, leads me to want you to tell the audience how it was you came upon this story. Just a Sure. I was working, I was doing something, it always happens like this, you're doing something tiny, small. I was working on a, a small, short article on shopping in Paris. Par in the late 17th century, it's the beginning of real luxury shops, shopping in public, uh, and the Queen's embroiderer that has a shop that is the, one of the first great shops. He invents, for example, the glass storefront. This is a pretty good thing. And so I was trying to find out if the furniture displayed in the image of his shop was furniture that he really owned. And this, I th so I thought, I'll go to, I offered the people who own the image, I said, I'll go to the archives, a day or two I'll give you, I have to, I'm ahead on this project, I'll see what I find. 
And so I found some predictable things that he was, he was the queen's embroiderer. I expected this. And then I found a document saying that a young woman with that name had been shipped to Louisiana on a boat. And I knew what that meant. It was like, you know, Mall Flanders, if people know the story of transportation for English prisoners, that she had been declared, a, she was guilty as a criminal and shipped off to populate the new colony. And that got me interested. So everything was an accident. I had, uh, I was, the Ar National Archives where I was looking close at four. The archives that hold the prison files close at five. I walked out at four. I happened to run into walking his bicycle on the street, someone who used to be the head of the collections of the prison files. And I said to him, this call number is bothering me. I don't know where it is. He said, oh, he thought about it. He said, oh, no, that's not a comma. That's a period. You know where that is. And I said, I know where that is. And I had an hour. And I raced there. And I got in. I said, don't give me trouble. I want to see this. And I want to see it today. And I will, be, I will get out in time, I promise you. And so they let me have it. And I saw, in fact, that this was the daughter of that man, and that there was this, an incredible story there. And that's how it all started, one day. <laughs> wow. And, and then it, it took you, not only did it take you how long to put oh, the story together? Oh, but, years. Uh, but I, knew, I wouldn't have done it, I think, had I not known from the beginning the big outline. The great embroiderer, mm -hmm someone who would declare his daughter a prostitute and have her shipped off. And then, you know, so once you have that, you have two elements that push you to go on. I wouldn't have gone on either for either one of them separately, perhaps. So, and then years, years of just daily grind. But I, I like it. I mean, you have to like doing that sort of crazy stuff. How much of that daily grind did you spend in Paris and how much in, back in Pennsylvania where you teach at the university? Right. Now, people would say it's not a grind if it's in Paris. Honestly, if you're in the archives all day long, you don't know. It doesn't matter where you are in a sense. So most of it was in Paris. That's where the archives are. And there, very little is online of this. And also, when you're doing work on files like this, they're complicated. You can't, doing them online is not the same thing. You have to see the actual size of the paper the handwriting, the, the things that you learn from the physical artifact that you can't get online. This is very much a book about material culture, about the physical things themselves. You hear that, millennials? Yeah. Anyway, yeah, you bring, you bring people into the book to the point where you describe uh, the, the height of the box, yep. the color of the ribbon, the worn quality mm -hmm. of the ribbon. And uh, I just want to say here that since we, since we are covering two centuries and 28 minutes, minus whatever time we've been right. talking, um, the, can you give a grand outline of the, of the subjects, seriously, that you've covered in here that are going to be covered? Okay. Well, what I, what I found happening was that I was really telling the story of France right. through the story of two families. So two centuries. The Bourbons are monarchs from the very early 17th century till the Revolution, so the very end of the 18th. And that was the span of the family documents that I had. So I began the first documents, and the moment at which they moved to Paris from the provinces were very early in the 17th century. The end of it all is with the revolution when, in which the fifth and sixth generation are doing very different things. So I cover everything from Louis XIV and the glory days of Versailles to the Regency and the crazy period in the early 18th century between the death of Louis XIV and the reign of Louis XV through Louis XVI and all the problems with the decadence there, the revolution and all the changes from a monarchy to a, a beginnings state. of a state in France. And the families involved with all of this, and then they very conveniently for me disappear. So I put an end to early 19th century, that's it. It was clean. There's not one showing up in phone books anymore. So I really chased them from their appearance to their disappearance, but they were synonymous in a way with all of the big events of that, everything. And they travel all over the world, so they have the French colonies, um, the question of slavery and the French involvement, the pre French uh, abolitionist movement, the anti-abolitionist movement. I mean, there, they got mixed up in everything. I kept, I'd say, I'd say, oh my God, not there too. And there they were. And, and not, I mean, to your point, <clears throat> to embroider it a little bit, so to speak, uh, at one point, the heroine uh, has, a, has a conversation or has a, uh, relationship with uh, the man who wrote *Man in Lascaux*, yeah. and uh, when nothing else was known of these lifestyles, he, you know, he wrote the first expose in literary form, and she was the one that you think may have inspired much of it. Yeah, I don't see how anyone else could have because she, among her incredible exploits, was this young woman who was declared a prostitute by her father. By her own father. By her own father, 
put into prison, put onto a chain gang, and walked from Paris to Le Havre to take a boat. Um, the story of the novel Manon Lescaut is that in the end, her, the man she's in love with, or who's in love with her, tries to help her escape. They fail, and she dies. Well, in this case, they succeed. And she does escape. I, I, obviously, I don't have the details of that. The police don't t describe their failures. But she escaped, got back to Paris. They go to London to get married because they couldn't get married in France because their fathers, she'd been declared a prostitute. Her life was over legally in France. They make it to London. They find a chapel that is, no one has a record of the functioning of this chapel as a Catholic chapel for a dozen years. But they got married there, and I have the license from this showing that they got married there. So they find all of this, get married in London, and they are there at a moment. We don't know anything about the author's Prévost's life at that moment, but he's there, and she's there, and he manages to learn events that are not part of the public record. So I don't see who else could have been his source for this and someone who had lived through all of this and knew about what the women's lives were. Uh, this is truly Shakespearean. Well, no, no other, no other uh, pair of families thrown together by happenstance could possibly have touched this many events, created this many scenarios. Um, uh, hated each other. Hated each other. <laughs> uh, risen from the ashes like a phoenix mm -hmm. from, uh, every, every you know, time and time again. And uh, created this wonderful flesh and blood uh, foreground for, for the, the wonderful history that you create around them, from the, the, the French bank being created to, um, as you were saying, colonialism and anti-colonialism, slavery, uh, the history of Haiti, um, the, the, the parts salt and sugar played in the economy, mm -hmm. uh, the, the winter 1709 when 25,000 Parisians woke up dead, so to speak because of the cold. Literally. Um, it wasn't uh, history. It was a very, very difficult time for most people. And I think one of the things that interested me when, as I was working through it and that drove me to continue was that we know about all these big events. We have a big fresco of what French history is, but we never see that their effects on ordinary people. Now, these people are not ordinary in that they're brilliant, crazy, whatever, mm -hmm. but they are small people. They're not in any way distinguished, so we have no idea of what it was like to live through this. And every time I would see dates becoming important, I just had to think, oh, that's what it was. And so it would be what people call the great winter. That is the winter when people were dying. All the death toll was higher than in World War II for France, and their families have major figures wiped out during this, so that it's as though all the big, there were sort of Forrest Gump-like, Shakespeare and Forrest Gump, and that they showed up at every big moment, uh, so that I had to exactly. foreground that, yeah. Exactly. Take us, take us back to the early part of your book where you really set the stage for the, the glory, the glamour, and the foreboding um, of what the Sun King looked like in his great hall of mirrors at night with candelabra, guests dressed to the hilt, mm -hmm. and himself, the king, uh, just positioned in these incredibly detailed, interwoven, overwoven gold and silver garments. Yeah. Describe that I for I think you. we forget today. People think, for example, when they go to Versailles, they think the mirrors are the big deal. But the mirrors were only a deal because they reflected the surfaces that were positioned around them. We also think of the paintings on the ceilings. You couldn't see those at night. They were too high. Whereas what you could see was all embroidery. All around, when Louis XIV would sit on his throne, all around him, behind him, were huge embroidered panels. They were eight feet high of all done in gold and silver embroidery. On the feet, uh, on the steps leading up to the throne and under the feet of people who would go to pay their homage to him, Turkish carpets. Turkish carpets were valuable, but nothing like a Turkish carpet re-embroidered in silver and gold by the Queen's embroidery. Now that was worth money. And Louis XIV himself had incredible outfits. They're no, solid silver and gold embroidery, just no fabric to show, everything gold and silver. And p the techniques are great so that they would do different depths of embroidery. So some things are built up so that they would reflect differently. They use silver and gold, different shades of silver and silver and gold, so that when candles reflected, you have these gleaming and glittering. So he was the spectacle. 
I mean, he was just shining, everything around him with the panels, the outfit, the carpet. Uh, it must have been an extraordinary thing to have. You, power was embroidery, in a sense, for, his, for Versailles under Louis XIV. You give that impression very well. And I, I almost was envisioning a hologram, I mean, mm. in, in, the, in, the, in the candlelight when right. he moved. He right. must have oh, looked yeah. like a spirit. Absolutely. Uh, and people would write the uh, embroiderer, the, king's, the queen's embroiderer, and say, that jacket was amazing that he was wearing. Can you copy that for me? And that was great for me because then I got prices. So I knew what they paid for them. We think today of the designer, the couturier, is the guy who makes, sews the outfit, makes the, puts, has the jacket made up. That person was paid 40 times less than the embroiderer because the embroiderer, that was the work that counted. That's what made your outfit. Everybody could have a jacket that looked, I'm sorry, your jacket is very nice, but it, a jacket cut like that, it worthless. Could be some gold. Worthless, exactly. Covered with gold and silver embroidery, then you have an outfit that people want to copy. Because your style is different, is determined by the out design of your embroidery. So the brilliant embroiderer is a designer and knows how to make designs different from other designs. And that's what you need. Well, one fact that you put out there, which uh, caught me uh, um, like a slap in the face, was you said the, the luxury goods industry paid for Versailles, basically. Well, Versailles, sir, I mean, I think it's a, a work together. France is, has, is still known, mm -hmm. and it's still the major force in the French economy, and that begins with Versailles and Louis XIV. He's promoting everyone because of this. And someone who is the queen's embroiderer, for example, makes money from the court and from that appointment, but he makes much more money because he is known as the queen's embroiderer and private clients come to him, both from France and elsewhere. So it's the real beginning of a fashion industry, something that can sell French-made goods all over the world, and they're still living on it. And the name Louis Vuitton you introduce. Yeah. Well, because one of the things I, that took me totally by surprise was the embroiderer was the son of and trained as someone just like Vuitton who made cases. I mean, the Vuitton family made trunks and carrying cases for precious objects. They still do, but that's what they did in the 19th century. Purses are just a 20th century and 21st century add-on to this profession, and that's what the family traditionally did. So that the lots of these incredible cases uh, took design to hold a specific object, and that's what they do. So it's a different craft. And case makers were called gagnés. Yes, because uh, again, it's a, something like a, 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 something that wraps around a sheath. So it encloses an object in view. I mean, beautiful. They're not as you know. The, the technique is incredible to make them. It's it's difficult to uh, proceed in a in a direct line with talking about this book yeah. because it's so rich in in history. It's so rich in examples that I almost want to give people uh, more of a, a just a taste of it. Uh, suffice to say, as you were saying. Uh, you know, Money, power, and politics uh, pitted two families against one another, actually pitted the patriarchs of two families against one another, and everyone down the line from them paid for it. Uh, most of them, many of them brutally. These fathers actually engaged in a, uh, uh, a warfare that, that included their own children. They, they sent their own children off to die. They denied they existed. They denied their wives. They took second and third wives. Um, their behavior was beyond unconscionable. And, but you, you take pains in the end of the book to talk about how you, uh, they weren't uh, necessarily uh, representative of, of the general population, but they were real, and they were part of the society that had uh, created itself around the fringes of royal patronage. And in the centuries where royal patronage was the best and only way to secure a future for yourself and your family, they did whatever they had to do. No question. There was al there's also the question, I think, of a moment arising between the late 17th century and the first decades of the 18th century when it becomes uh, the norm for people like artisans, etc., middle class people, to want lots of money as quickly as possible. I really saw a growth of that from people who before wanted an honest living. You know, your dream was to have a shop. Maybe you could own the property in which you mm -hmm. lived. Nothing bigger than that. And for me, it was something parallel to perhaps what we've lived through in this country in the decades from the end of the 20th century and the beginning of this one. I remember for me the key moment was the day I came back. And you'll see why I'm saying this. It seems crazy. I came back from France, and I was in, you're in the long line to check passports. And I look up, and the television is showing us stock market quotes. And I think, 
why are they showing stock market? Today, the stock market's everywhere. And these families witnessed a parallel development. That is the sense that you had to invest your money. The birth of it. Yeah, exactly. It's the first time. It's, it is a, they will end with the creation of an actual stock market and stock and a huge bubble of stock, a huge rise over the period of seven months from 500 to 10,500. And this drives them crazy with greed. But it's the first time. And it made me worry a lot about a country like ours in which we're seeing Everyone knows where the stock market is. We follow it. We see it. People are warning, is, it, is, there, is this, this a bubble? Will it burst, et cetera? And we are exactly three centuries later in all of this. Next year, 17, 19, 20, 2019 worries me a lot. Uh, and what do we do now? You're in good company. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, but what do we do with this knowledge? See, they had, they just would all continue to invest, and then almost everyone, almost all small investors, when the bubble burst, lost. And that's when they lashed out at their children. So that people paid. I really had a sense of living a world in which, perhaps for the first time, people who were capable of behaving atrociously, savagely, could do so for money and feel that they were in a society where this was being encouraged in a way. Uh, absolutely encouraged, at least at that level, yeah. at least at that Oh, area. surely. And uh, this, the, but the, lest you at home get depressed hearing all this, the story of the characters of the, I, I, don't hit me, but Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the story of, the story of those characters is so heartening that, that you, you, you it, for, well, the, well the, the prose is crisp and it carries you along on its own, but, but you make, you make these people 300 years after their death with no other information about them. And just by giving the facts around their actions, you make them come to life. Well, they, the fight to stay together was so extraordinary. I mean, to rescue her from the boat, to manage. I don't know how they got to London, but they got to London. How did they get married? They got married. They, come, they, they fight everything, and they continue, and they stay together. For, and they have decades together. They even have some decades, some years during which they manage to live together openly. It doesn't last long, but they never give up. And then the next generations too, always young people. For me, it was an extraordinary story of survival, that you can have the worst parents ever, and it doesn't have to end in a double death wish like Romeo and Juliet. It can go on. You can have a life. There can be a child that goes on to be the, the child of the Romeo figure, one of the most remarkable young men ever. He goes on to be the one involved with the man who invents public education for the deaf right. and to run a magnificent home in which he boards deaf children. I mean, this is truly an incredible life, right? To devote himself to this and gave up money. This man never touched money. He had enough to keep his house going to do this. He had a salary. He never invested. I didn't see a single shred of investment in anything. He just wanted a decent living. Get two pairs of shoes, a couple of suits, end of it. And speaking of money and greed, this also takes place during the time when you said there was the very first food shortage, the first food shortage in the world created by speculation yeah. in the grain market. Yep, exactly. And the Queen's embroiderer is stocking grain in the basement of his shop. When I saw that, I thought, what is this about? And then, of course, I learned that people were starting to manufacture food shortages. I mean, this, you know, how do you manage to be such a clever investor and so evil about so many time. things, yes. At the same time. Exactly. And still charming enough to keep finding oh, extra women on oh, the side. Oh, must have been real charmers. No question about it. Every time there was a lull, I knew there'd be a new woman coming up. The minute the money ran out from one, the next one, he was, he was preparing like six months in advance. Now, my personal theory, the thing I never dared say is that he killed or hastened the deaths of several wives because it was just too perfect. People, right. people don't disappear just when you have a, rich, in a richer, younger successor looming on the horizon, but they always did. But that I couldn't say. There's no proof. If the police don't investigate it, I can't investigate it. It's my rule. 
And I did want to mention the, the uh, 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 one more great act of passion that was, f that was son for father, and that was Claude, who showed um, uh, an inexplicable desire to be reunited with his father yes, when no. he knew right. that he had hastened the death of some of his siblings. Right, yeah. And then the father betrayed even that. I yeah, mean, you can't yeah, make yeah. this up, as you say. No, I know. But don't you, for me, it rang true. I think mm -hmm. children do want to believe Especially he'd been very young. His father put him in chains in their apartment to get him to run away so he wouldn't have to feed him. But you want to believe that the parent was good in the long run, I think, and so much older that the parent could have changed. He's, an old, he's older, he's remarried, um, he's reaching out to you, he wants to create a business with you, and of course he gets creamed by it all, and uh, it ruins much of his life because he had rebuilt a wonderful life with a wonderful woman, uh, in-laws, a real family, all these children, and his father does it again. But I understood that, the hope, the power of hope. Well, he must have missed that Aesop fable where um, the scorpion says as yeah. he kills the uh, frog that gives him a ride across the pond. After yeah. all, I'm still a scorpion. Yeah, but at least they're not related. You know, seriously, a son, <laughs> you want to believe your father's <laughs> decent, I think. No. In the book, you take, a, you take a razor out every time you write the word uh, Hausman. You want to tell us a little bit about that? You mean just, because of uh, the, the story of the Paris? The destruction, the, oh, the yeah, path of destruction absolutely. that led to modern Paris. Right, uh -huh. that so much of this story is a Parisian story and it's about neighborhoods and where people lived and so much of what I'm trying to describe for people no longer exists because I have to say they put this boulevard there and so this church was destroyed, etc. Whereas what's lovely to see is how much of it is a neighborhood story that people knew each other in certain neighborhoods, there was a life, a kind of feel about different neighborhoods, and that's important. I try to recreate that to show it is a Parisian story, very definitely a Parisian story, all through. And as an historian, it's making your work all the more difficult when you realize that when there's been urban clearing like that, that well, you just have to remember that it was there and to it walk it. I just walk the streets and try to see them where, to see what was there before this. I think it's, a, you know, it's not, it's not impossible as a task. A lot of this book hinges on the idea of handwriting, script writing, the ability to do so, the ability to sign your name, and uh, one of the chapters is all about forgery. Yeah. And uh, not, only, not only forgery, but handwriting later in the book where you talk about the, uh, you know, you talk about the eminence of having signatures of, of famous well-known people uh, on a, a wedding, uh, right. witnessing a wedding. And, um, I'm wondering, I'm wondering what do you think the French think of our ending our handwriting program? I wonder a lot about it for all kinds of reasons. I mean, everyone's talking about the fact that handwriting, the ability to write, mm -hmm. has an effect on the brain. So there oh, will yes. be changes uh, because of this. And I really felt that it was so interesting to watch the rise of literacy through all this. I was especially interested in women's literacy and mm -hmm. how many of the women. I was also interested in literacy among artisans because these are people who are running shops. You have to, they have to work with people, they have to keep accounts. So literacy was, in a sense, uh, necessary for them. And to feel about the disappearance today, and then literacy becomes, and the ability to write well becomes right. an important thing. And then with that, of course, when you have crazy masterminds, they realize that you can forge. and uh, That gives you another power. You can control everyone by doing that. And I wrote, I wrote in my sure. notes, good bit of detective work, because you, you spotted, um, how, how, do, you want to, do you want to say well, it, or shall we leave I, it as a mystery? That, that there is, a, he had a double at one point. Was, I mean, if a, you're doing dirty business, it helps if you are two performing things, and he, cre he used a, a double. There's a very mysterious member of the family that exists pretty much only on paper. Right. Uh, and I, that, that I, can th I thank great handwriting experts, because I would never, it's very hard to be sure when you're, dealing, when you're dealing with a good forger, with a forgery. So I would send signatures with no explanation and say, what do you think? Is uh -huh. this possible? Da, 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 da. And we would uh, work from there. Oh, you checked yourself in a double blind often. I was very impressed with that. Um, speaking of design and uh, the, the, what, what France is responsible for and the intersection of, of the, the glory of, of the glamour fabric and, and um, art, the, um, the family also intersected with the Chantilly workshops. Would you oh, mention yeah. that? 
this is this is the young man who was kept in chains and then um, tried to uh, make peace with his father. Uh, he became one of the great designers of this incredible workshop that was inventing uh, the Chinese style. So he really helps. He's he's one of the, among the first people to know be known as a designer by the, with the modern terminology, and he creates what is the Chinese look adopted all over the world for well over a century. So there was, it was really a family of great designers. And then his, his, uh, the next generation become great architects. So it's like the history from embroidery to architecture of what people do with draftsman's skills. This, this is the richest incidental history of a series of biographies I've ever come across in a, in a history. You even have the, the Romeo figure as being a, a hidden painter. Absolutely. That stunned me too when I found I was just, sometimes I would just go through boxes of police arrests to see, this family came up everywhere so there was a good chance I would find someone in trouble. And I came across him and realized that all his life he had been hiding. His father wanted him to be a lawyer like the rest of the family. So once again, I think a, a story we could believe today, he didn't want to be a lawyer. He, you know, he tried doing this, but he painted. He had a secret workshop, and he painted all his life, and was so good that he well, couldn't be legal, because if he had had the legal right to paint with the guild, they'd have, um, his father would have known. So the guild finds him and shuts him down, because he's doing copies that he can sell so well that he's taking money from the official painters of the day. Well, Joan, you're a detective. Did you ever um, come across uh, evidence of one of his paintings? No. Uh, that, okay. They destroyed. Everything yeah. in his workshop was destroyed when they found him. So my right. guess is... Uh, but, 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 but there might still be things... They, that he would never have been able to sign them. Right. You see, he's illegal. Illegal artists can never sign. Well, see, I think you're up to that challenge. Oh, sure. I intend to look at every painting in, uh, remaining in France from the 18th century and try to find them. No, I'd say, I drew, even though I had few limits, I drew a few occasionally. I'd stop, just say, that's it. What would you like to say about the book that we haven't covered as our time draws near? Only that I believe that these characters are truly characters that people can understand in today's terms. For me, they didn't feel like characters from that far in the past, from three centuries ago. I think that there was the strength of the passions they inspired, the ways they chose to live, the battles between children and parents. Before, early, before this, there's no evidence to find this kind of uh, the struggle for a child to create a new identity, not the identity chosen by the family. You wouldn't see this. And to find this in the part of young women and young men, for me, was extraordinary. It's, it really is a moment that I think leads to money made us perhaps what we are. For better or for worse. Exactly, and both. Now, Joan, you've taught at uh, Princeton and Yale, and this is your sixth book on, seventh on Sorry, eighth? 11th. 11th. That's what I said, 11th book mm -hmm. on Parisian history yeah. and the, the impact of it not only regionally but in the world. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's wonderful to have someone so dedicated to, to a particular period. Do you ever have a desire to write about another time? Or well, for, for me, it's really simple. I know mm -hmm. this period really well, so I can explore different subjects in it. I think, I, for me, the real dream, at one point I said to someone, I'm going to write a history about five years of, this, of the period, and they said, how about doing 10 minutes, given you, because you'll dig into everything, and that I enjoy. I enjoy feeling that as any moment has, there's so much happening in a moment. You're in this room, this furniture, this clothing. Uh, there's handwriting. There are books everywhere. Uh, for me, it's just about realizing, and I'm always a book person, so I always start with the books that a period produces. That's what that was said about, uh, that's what Nelson Algren said, the American author. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you're, an right, American, you're an American. Yeah, yeah. Where he said that uh, someone would be lucky to write about Division Street his whole life and, and uh, cover to everything. Totally. I, I think any, any house could be written about. I, often, I even considered doing this about a house, the house that traveled through two centuries with one of the families. Oh, yeah. Now, you spent time in some of these houses. Too. Oh, yeah. I managed. One of them had an apartment for sale. That was my great coup. That when I convinced a real estate agency that I might be trying to buy an apartment in this house and got in and managed to photograph the rooms and do measurements to determine that it was the same size as it had been in 1612. Do you speak French without an accent? No, I'm a Louisianian, so I have, I've never tried to hyper-correct my accent in French. So you're from Louisiana? Mm -hmm. Yep. That, that was the real catch. When I see she's shipped to Louisiana, I think, yeah. oh, God, they've got me. 
I'm not going to give up. And, and tell people at home why they were shipped to Louisiana. Why did they take white women? They there? wanted, to, they had a few soldiers over there. They mm -hmm. wanted wives for them fast. Cheapest way to do that, get them out of prison, stick them on a boat, chain them up, send them over. And they were terrified of interracial relationships. Absolutely. They don't want the, the French are beginning to have children with Indian women. So they want some French women over there to control the bloodlines. Right. So they send these incredible women who were also really remarkable, and someone like Louise Magoulet, the Queen's embroiderer's daughter, to think of you know, shipping her off in a chain gang. And one other, uh, uh, I don't know, heroic figure is the woman with whom uh, Louise escaped, uh -huh. being the wife of... I love it. The um, greatest, one of the greatest criminals, Robin Hood of France, Cartouche is his name, who is, there are more exploits, of, he, ha he is more storied than Robin Hood. And people hate him or people love him. I personally think he was a pretty clever guy and that his gang was much maligned by the police who tried to infiltrate it and do everything to stop it. But she was his, he was his wife, legally married. And to have her on the chain gang escaping along with Louise, that was too much. When I saw her name, I, every time I would just keep saying, they can't be doing this, but they did. Uh, Joan DeGene, I want to thank you very much. And for you at home, if what we talked about is not enough to titillate you to buy this book right now, uh, you had a stroke a few minutes ago. Because this is a wonderful volume published by Bloomsbury, a $30 book um, sent, uh, distributed by Macmillan, mm -hmm. wonderful publisher and uh, distributor. So we'd like to thank the people at Bloomsbury for uh, providing your company today. And I know you're on a book tour. You've got another function in a little while tonight. And uh, I think we're reaching the end of this broadcast. I want to thank you all for being here. Coming up soon, just want to say that uh, the Authors Network continues. Um, a House Divided, author Christopher Teeters will join Bjorn Skaptison uh, to discuss Practical Liberators. A look at the letters of Union Army officers and emancipation. That's June 7th at 5 p.m. Be here or we'll talk about you. Uh, also, Lady Bird and Friends, author Chris Rylander will be here along with host Betsy Bird to discuss his new epic adventure series for middle grade readers, The Legend of Greg, book one in the Failures series. Um, Chris joins us on June 12th at 5.30. Don't miss that. So um, we didn't get any questions. OK, so we are going to thank call it so a day. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's that a pleasure. Joan DeGene, thank <laughs> yep, you so thank much. Thank you. Lovely to be here.